I thought that was a really very rich session, which reflects the richness of the book, but also has some new new stuff. So that was great. Um, so let's open it up for questions, uh, ma'am. Let's collect three, okay? So I'll do one, two, three this time. So it's at the back. All right, so I'm slightly surprised that there was no mention of government failure in, in all of the, the discussion, because in many developing countries, who are the focus of this this work? The government is probably the biggest investor in education and all of that. So if any government policy fails, that will certainly influence the mobility in, uh, mobility in education. For example, in Ghana, we used to have three years education for senior high school, and then the next president came and said, I don't like that, I want to make it four years. So that literally truncates the educational path of a generation in that period. There could be free education in other places. The next government come into office and say, I don't want to sponsor free education. So that will feed into that. And even in developing, developed countries like the US, for example, income mobility can actually be affected by the government as well. Because for, if you are a single household person, to qualify for social welfare, you have to earn less than $1,500. So there is, if you are a risk averse person, there is that tendency to try and work at the minimum so you can keep getting that benefit. So there's no incentive to work and get 2000 or 2005 So there's that cap on how much you can make, and that limits your mobility in income. So why are we not looking at how government can influence upward or downward mobility in income and education? Was that aimed at a particular speaker? Or just uh, I think uh, Kuna Sim can start and then... <laughs> <laughs> So let's, but let's, let's collect uh, two more. I just want you to be thinking about the other lady or something. Thank you. Um, for a very interesting set of presentations. Um, my first question goes to, is it Okuno? Yeah. Yes. Um, so in your description of how you measure mobility, you said you created a dummy, right? So I'm just wondering what happens when it's actually zero. So if it's positive, then it's, there's upward mobility. And if it's negative, then it's downward mobility, from my understanding. So how do you deal with the zeros? Um, I'm just wondering if you consider the situation where you're looking at maybe three mutually exclusive like you know, um, categories, where you have upward and um, downward, and let's say no, a situation where there's no um, mobility. I'm just wondering you know, your thoughts on that. And my last question goes to um, Patricia? Yes. Um, so, I don't know maybe whether I missed it or maybe it was because of lack of time. So, what, for your, from your presentation, was there um, like um, an empirical analysis? And if you, if you did do this, what were the results showing? Because from your discussion, you were showing three main things that could be driving these. So that it wasn't very clear to me whether you know, there was some empirical analysis that was done and what the results showed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vito? Yeah, I have one specific question for Fahad Shukri. I, I, I know the, the, the report that discussed, so I, I know that was a general question I made them at that time. I have a specific question on the coincidence bias. Uh, can you say something more on the magnitude and the direction uh, on this, on the data you... Thank you. Okay, so let's start. Who wants to start? Well, let me start. I mean, actually, obviously, I totally agree. Government failures, or rather, gov lack of investment, public investment, education, and so on, is very important. The chapter that uh, Jerry Behrman did on human capital showed, uh, so Jerry did a great review of all the literature on human capital and mobility. And I should just say that he then developed that chapter to a book, which is a, will be a Cambridge University Press book that we will publish very soon in our new series with CUP, which is going to be, will be the CUP elements is the term economics. The book is pretty much just going to happen, going to come out very soon, open access as all this. So in that, in the book, he develops it much more. The argument is that he makes that the early childhood education is the most critical for mobility. It really what happens, and I think Shiko kind of transitionally talked about it in your first slides. The first five years of what happens in a child's life is really important. I mean, obviously, what happens in school, what happens in university, all that, but it's just the first five years. That's what the literature, the evidence is showing. And there's quite a good literature now, especially perhaps in Latin America, more than Africa and Asia, on how early childhood investment 
has this huge effect on mobility of the, of the child. And I think that's where, you know, one has to, the government has got scarce resources on, on human capital investment, maybe that's where it should spend, looking at the evidence on this. Uh, so I'll just ask you to read Jerry Berman's chapter on this, on this, and then the, the book is going to be out, coming out very soon, because that's a really, I think, very important for us, because we have, in economics, neglected that a little bit. We have neglected that a little bit because we always felt, felt that primary education, secondary education are, are quite important. We didn't ever think that the first five years is where cognitive ability gets developed. And cognitive ability is really fundamental in mobility. Right, if you, if you get impaired, and, and we know that differs a lot, so cognitive ability differs a lot, as I think you showed, should go through this morning, by income status. So you are a poor kid, you can't go to an early childhood education program because that's only for rich children, right away you're disadvantaged, right? And that's where the government can step in. That's where I think there's a huge role for the government. I think we should think more about those sorts of programs than often what we think about, which is schooling and so on. The other thing I should schooling, I should say, the one problem I have with the education mobility literature is only talk about quantity, not quality. Quality of education differs remarkably across the developing world. But there is yet to see, I've yet to see a paper that looks at quality of education and looks at mobility because we don't have, again, uh, measures of, of, say, the, the measures we use tend to use on uh, the piece of measures on, on, on ability over generations. And I think that's something we need to think about. It. Why are we not yet there on looking at education mobility, where we bring in quality, and not just focus on, on quantity. Because quantity, in my view, is a very imperfect measure of education, education these days. Thanks. Who's good? Was, okay. Uh, your question was, what, what was the extent of bias? I can tell you that uh, certain type of coincidency where you see the father and mother and only a subset of children, the uh, bias for the relative persistence measure was uh, simple. The slope estimate was something to the point of like 30%. So that was pretty big. And I, relative to that, the standardized measure had a lot less bias, something below 10%. So that's that's actually our Journal of Human Resources paper, if you want to look at it. Uh, for the intercept, I don't recall <laughs> the bias numbers, but biases, I mean, the attenuation bias of 30% is big enough that you need to worry about it. And I also wanted to come on the, uh, on the uh, government action. You know, I just want to add a little bit. I think, you know, it, while we talk about social norms, institutions, and all this, government action is already, you know, this is everywhere in the mind of everything, okay? So it's not just, you know, government policy related to education, it's government policy, for example, you know, you can think of trade liberalization, having roads constructed, things like that. All of these things, actions have implications for mobility or immobility. And a lot of the time, what the intention of the government is, you know, as we say that you want to have all children do better. In, on average, you know, a lot of the actions do, but it a lot of the actions, the unintended consequence is that it increases persistence too, sometimes. So that's... That's where the you know frontier literature is <laughs> right now. Okay, <laughs> with that. Yeah. So let me. Uh, so you had a question about the mobility measure, right? So that's an, a question we also have been thinking and wondering. So what I didn't have time to talk about is other works that we have been doing is using other measures as a robustness, similar to Chetty's like uh, P25 measures or Sam or uh, Paul Novosad's. Uh, f bottom 50 percent measures so we are actually on the works but we didn't want to show it now in the essence of time so yeah that's a very valid point thank you <clears throat> kunal do you want to add anything i mean i think we you know again this question of uh, how to measure mobility so the zero one is essentially upward is one zero is no movement or downward 
So that's the way we defined it. And this is the Allison of, so the paper Allison Econometrica has a similar thing, similar method. Um, you could argue that we're not allowing therefore the continuum of mobility downward, upward, and, uh, upward and not, not changing. And I think the continuous measure is probably better in that sense. It's just the upward, the, the decontinuous measure is easier to think about because is it in a, in, a, in a regression framework? But I agree, we should, the continuous measure is probably more informative, exactly as you said. So yeah, so I think you asked about whether what I was talking about was part of a specific, uh, I guess, empirical exercise. So my chapter was more of a set the stage type of uh, chapter for the book, where my job, as I interpreted it, was was to to ask you ask ourselves the question: Why is mobility lower in developing countries? Then the way I decided to answer the question was: Okay, let's look at the general development economics literatures and all the questions that we are answering in that literature and see how it can help us in, in the mobility literature to see where those potential mechanisms are. So the things that we're mentioning, we're not part of a new empirical analysis, we're taking from results, empirical and published results from the literature to say, okay, okay, we see that if we give money to grandma, then the, the prime aged individuals in the household, they migrate. Okay, that sounds like something that might affect mobility. We see that if we reduce the information friction, lower income students are more likely to go to college. Okay, that speaks about mobility. So that was the, the, what I did in the chapter. So all the, the findings that, I, if I use that word, I apologize, but all the results that I was describing were results from the literature. They were, they were not part, this chapter did not produce any new empirical results. Great. I'll, I'll just add one tiny point to Konau's um, uh, point about uh, quality of education, which is that in the inequality of opportunity literature, because we obviously don't have to have the same outcome, and we don't have to have quality of the education for the parents, there are a couple of papers looking at the effect of inherited circumstances on test scores, um, but that's only in the in the IOP literature, and you're absolutely right, not in the not in the IGM literature. Okay. A second round of questions. I think there was a gentleman there. The gentleman there, and if you're behind, if you can't see me from the screen here, please um, jump. But we have Murray, so uh, let's start with you, sir. Yes. Yes, yes, a question for Patricio and Manuel. Uh, I mean, it has to do with the government failure, thing that I wanted to spend a different way, <coughs> which is more this clientelist political economy uh, type of mechanisms. So, um, so for example, you can have, so it has to do partly with the networks thing that you were saying. So it has to do with um, getting a job in the public sector, right? Uh, but it can also have to do with uh, allocation of public uh, sector infrastructure, right? So communities that are more privileged, like might be able to engage better in some clientelist like relations with politicians so that they end up having like more. And so I feel that this could potentially be a big driver for higher uh, mobility. So what do you think about that? And Next was someone here. Uh, this is for Kunal, Terence Gomez from University Malaya. I'd like to, you didn't have time to build on the point, but you raised it that from the book, it became clear that an interdisciplinary approach is much better to get insights into the problems that we are trying to address. I'd like to push you on that point. What exactly is it about interdisciplinary research that you found, or the book, the people who contributed to the book found, in terms of how this can help solve problems? I just want to make one more point. In 2008, after we had the global financial crisis, there was a big debate about economics. And at the University of Manchester, the students protested against the way in which economics was being taught. And the debate then arose also about the same point that you're making, that there needs to be an interdisciplinary approach. A political economy approach was just mentioned. So I want to put this point to you to see how, when you were doing this book, how did these ideas come true? And what is this new approach, this new interdisciplinary method that you're talking about? Murray, maybe you can speak really loud so I don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I just to pick up on the point about education, and quality of education. I'm just wanting to push the panel a bit, I guess, on 
Okay, but what are we to make of this? Uh, Chico just referred back to the fact that this does link to equalities of opportunity. Do we want to adjust the way we measure education? Or is, are we going to continue to measure education the way we are and then work out in specific contexts like South Africa, for example, where there's been huge progress in years of schooling, uh, but it, it hasn't translated into equality of, of what education gives people uh, in terms of mobility and especially, you know, there's a gender dimension to that where they bump into a labor market that's skewed, but there's just a general dimension of that where the, where, this, where years of schooling mean different things now. Um, and so that's just a, an issue. You know, do we want to adjust what we think of as education as like an equality of opportunity or, uh, or, or the way it drives mobility? Or, or are we happy to use the measure that we have and, and then treat and look into the context as to why it's working differently? The thing that worries me about the latter is that we produce these correlation coefficients, right? Of educational correlations. But what we're saying implicitly is that in different contexts they they're very they're very different uh, because of the quality relation. Thanks. Thank you. Um, maybe let's start with Farhad and work this way or Okay. Well, let's let's start with Kunal. <laughs> Nobody wants the mic. <laughs> uh, so I'll answer Mikhail's question. I'll let the other questions to you. And so, um, political economy, clientelism. So I didn't talk about that in the in the chapter, but that's a very good suggestion. Um, I'll make just one more one. So yeah, So the short answer is yes. It's it's something that would impact the the estimate we do, which is the intergenerational correlation. Just, just in terms of what you were saying, it would add one more channel of transmission, you know, well-connected parents, but uh, partially, you know, in South Africa it could be A and C or whatever connections you have. And, and so, so I guess the short answer would be yes, that's a channel to, to study. But then I, it also made me think about another point, which is I don't know if we want mobility to come from public sector jobs. So I guess that's uh, an empirical question, I suppose, <laughs> or, or maybe ideological question. Is that what we imagine mobility to become? Is that everybody from a lower income background gets a job in the public sector? So it could be one of the ways we create mobility if the public sector allows better screening of uh, uh, you know, good workers from, from certain segments of Zion, affirmative action, whatever it is. But I guess I would... I'm, I would have to think harder on whether uh, promising public jobs is the way to increase mobility, which is not what you're saying, by the way. <laughs> it's just that it made me think about that. So yeah, yes on the first question, and then uh, thanks for actually making me think of a second question. So let me answer Terence's question, and I'm going to use my response to Terence's question to answer Murray also, actually. So the point, so what did, what did I learn, or what did we learn as economists? from the, what, the papers that we commissioned from the non-economists. So first is, economists are absolutely obsessed with income mobility, okay? And then educational mobility. But you see hardly any papers on occupational mobility. The answer is like, why should we worry about occupation? Ultimately, occupation are getting higher incomes. But we should worry about occupation, why? First, because we don't have the data on income that we need. There's no way we're gonna get the data on income of the kind that we, we have for the US, the Nordic countries, and so on. Tax data, along with the fact that tax data does not include informal sector incomes. So we're not gonna get that, let's, let's be honest. Just accept that we will not get the income data to look at mobility the way that scholars have been looking at mobility in Nordic countries and in, in, in the US and so on. So income is not gonna get, get us very far, okay? Secondly, occupation itself is important. If you think about, agricultural worker in India, what does the person want? The person wants to get out of being an agricultural laborer, wants to be a teacher, wants to be a, a government clerk. Occupation makes a big difference in a person's life. That person's not income is important, but the person is much more worried about getting out of a bad occupation. And this is why sociologists have been very important to us because they've been saying, you guys should think about occupation, which is also a proxy for social class, right? So. We can learn as economists a lot from the sociologists, especially because sociologists are using 
quantitative methods as we do in a different way. They don't look at causal work. They look at a lot of descriptives, mobility matrices, but we can learn a lot from that kind of method. The second thing we can learn is that I don't think, I'm, I'm very much for causal evidence in this literature. We don't have enough causal papers, as Patricia said. So we need more papers which are causal, what, what shifts mobility. But we know that ultimately, as I was saying, mobility is not driven one factor that shifts somebody's lives. Things are happening at the same time in that person's life, the child's life. And this is where non-economists can help us using qualitative methods to tell us about what other things matter while we are still looking for our natural experiments and our policy experiments. So I do think bringing methods together can help economists to do better work in mobility. So I mean, I'm looking at it as an instrumental kind of approach that we can do better work in mobility as economists by actually bringing in other disciplinary in insights. So that's the second thing I would say, that first, get out of income. Education is important, but education, my, my, my response, education is a mechanism, not an end in itself. Nobody wants to be super educated and have a poor quality job. And the point is that what we see, as, as Arastup showed, you can get educated, but you don't often get good jobs. Why? Discrimination, um, inequalities in the provision of infrastructure, education, so on, all make a difference. Or, or other things, networks, as Patrick said, make a difference. So education, mobility is necessary, but not sufficient for getting us either income mobility or more importantly, occupational mobility. And exactly as I think Mario is saying that if we spend too much time worrying about education mobility, we might miss the fact that that's just a mechanism. That's something we want to see to get us what we really want, which is occupational income mobility. And that's why we need to be careful with education mobility. Sorry, Shikhan, <laughs> I'm looking at you, but I think we just have to say that it's interesting, but it's not really enough in the literature mobility, right? So I just want to stop there. Patrick? I, I can add, actually. And maybe I will disagree a little bit with Kunal, too. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the answer you're going to get from me is going to be an economist answer. Uh, I completely agree that educational quality is the one variable that we want to capture. Uh, and if you really think about it, the quality of education would, should be reflected in workers' productivity, or in other words, in income. And this is precisely why you know, the developing country, developed countries' literature focuses almost exclusively on income to s uh, measure economic uh, mobility. We are focusing on education simply because <laughs> we don't have income data. It's the same problem. We don't have education quality data. If we had quality data, I am sure that we would be able to come up with some kind of index that would tell you what the you know, productivity effect of this education. Now, I am going to disagree a little bit on the occupation mobility because this is something that actually that I started my life with. Uh, I mean, very first paper that we did was looking at occupational mobility. The r r problem with the occupational mobility is that the mobility measure is going to depend on at what detail you defined your occupation. Whether, you know, the overall farm versus non-farm, or whether you go in much more detail ISIC codes for this. That's, that would be number one. Number two is that just like education quality, content of a job or a occupation changes over time, right? Uh, and that is not something that, you know, just looking at occupational category, you'll be able to tell. And that's another reason, I think, why we should try and get data on income in developing countries, okay? And I do think that for a whole lot of developing countries, uh, there is enough data now that in maybe five, 10 years, we will be able to talk about income mobility too. So that's my economist response. Uh, no, no, I don't want to add anything in this. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a very interesting exchange, and I think there are things to both of that. It's very good. I like that. Um, any other questions? One here, 
Marcus, miss anybody? Let's start with uh, with you, sir. What role does um, what role um, the equality of outcomes and and, and uh, plays in the developing countries? Do we have sufficient data to look at the Great Gatsby curve only for the developing countries, for example? And and then maybe related to this is that the I mean. One difference that it's, um, it's, it's, it's large between developed and developing economies is the extent of redistribution, which is way larger in the, uh, in the rich world. So, I mean, this probably also has quite a bit uh, influence on, on, the, on, on in, at least some of the measures of inequality of um, opportunities. So I'm Marcus Yanti, I'm at Stockholm University. Um, I'll direct this, I have a kind of comment to Patricia, which you may want to reflect on, and, and then a um, somewhat more generic question. The comment to Patricia is that we, we know a lot about persistence, and we even know a lot about the kind of causal effects on persistence of, of different things, but we know a lot less about mobility in the sense of, of the expected deviation of people's outcomes from their expected value given their parental income. And we know even less about the causal impact, how, how different programs would impact on that, what you might think of residual variation. So persistence and mobility are interchangeable if errors are homoscedastic, but, but they're not. Um, so, so do you have any kind of Thought, thoughts on that if we should learn a lot. This is independent actually of whether or not you look at the poorer or richer countries. It's, it's true of the both. And, but the second question is somewhat more generic and sounds silly, but I actually think it's not, which is, could you elaborate a little bit more on, on why we should focus on, on mobility? So, so for instance, what are the welfare economic reasons for looking at intergenerational mobility. Um, I'd claim that they're actually much less obvious than the most people think, and in fact, this kind of tips things in favor of inequality of opportunity rather than looking at persistence, but, but I'll um, leave it at that. I, with that easy little question. Thanks, Rahul. Okay, let, let, let me, this time let me start on this side. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't think, you know, I, I remember all the questions, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the one that uh, Marcus asked last, what, why we should care about mobility. That is the question I can probably, you know, give some answer. And for to give that answer, I have to go back to one of the example that Chico already always said. So, and this, this I had used many times, so you can <laughs> tax me on this, which is that if you, inequality is something like cholesterol, okay? There is the LDL and there is the HDL, and one of them is good, one of them is not good. And inequality is similar. Some inequality is good because it, you know, motivate people to do work hard, you know, for the reward of it. So a lot of the innovations happens because of that motivation. And that is the type of inequality that we should be tolerating, certainly, and even encouraging to some extent. So that is good for welfare, no doubt of, about it. Now, some of the inequality is of the LDL quality, <laughs> okay? Uh, which is not good, and there is actually some empirical evidence that this is not just good in, from the point of view of, you know, what society thinks about what is good. It is also not good for human capital accumulation, for long-term economic growth, and so on. So I give you an example. If you think that distribution of talent is more or less, you know, random, in that case, if a poor family cannot send a kid to school, that certainly has 
the you know uh, negative impact, adverse impact on human capital accumulation, and through it, it also has negative Im implication for both economic growth and welfare. And that is the reason I think we should be looking at mobility. And that is precisely why I think that intergenerational persistence is something that gives us a, some sense of, you know, uh, what that friction is. And that's going to be my answer to <laughs> Marcus. So time flies when you're having fun. We're at time, so let me ask you each to answer those questions and make your final remarks in about one to two minutes. Each. I don't want to, yeah, I can like, so, give my time. Uh, to you. I just yeah. give a very quick response to Yuka. So, Yuka, one of the key stylus facts we know. Again, I, we have this in the book, and we use Pichu's great data set on, on our, the you know, equal opportunity, is that the Great Gatsby curve, right? The more unequal a society is in outcomes, the less, uh, the less there is a mobility of high persistence. Now, that is a correlation. It's not causal, right? And you can easily imagine the causal relationship can go in both directions. More unequal societies, lower income households have less to invest in the kids' education, right? Clearly, it will affect mobility. On the other hand, one can also see the higher mobility can lead to more poor income households, in a relative sense, increasing the incomes over time, catching up with the richer households, and that will lead to greater equality. So the causal relationship works in both directions. I don't necessarily think that it works in one direction. And I think it would be really good if we did more work on this, because I think it would be really nice to think of how we can causally estimate which way the relationship is stronger, if we do believe it goes both directions, right? I just want to say very quickly, this book that we did was actually a starting point for more research on social mobility. I hope that uh, you know, the book can help us to do some more interesting work, both on conscious methods and causal work, and also mixed methods, because definitely, and I think you know, this is a sense also what gets from the questions, there's a lot of work to be done, really, for developing countries. We are really at, a big, at the beginning of where we should be, and hopefully, you know, many of you here are thinking of more work on this, because there's really a need for much better quality work uh, on causes, drivers, methods, measurement, all of that. So hopefully that, that's the th something that we want. I just want to say this book is not an end point. It's a starting of a conversation on mobility. Thanks. That's actually a very good way to end. <laughs> but now I have to ruin it. But I'll just, I'll just say, answer Marcus's point about, yeah, your predicted value sort of versus deviation from that. Uh, actually, let, let me stay on that point. That's a good agenda for, for research, right? So it reminds me of the paper I have with Miles on occupation persistence at the top, right? You could think, speaking of drivers, of, of policies, interventions that help improve uh, or decrease persistence in specific parts of the distribution. Like, why should I get daddy's job? Why, maybe the government can intervene that. Is that fair? Right, so yeah, I'll just say that, that I agree with you on the nonlinear uh, idea. Yeah, and with doing more work on that. <laughs> okay, well, on, on that note then, let, let's uh, please thank our presenters. Uh, thank you very much.